Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Jakarta Tech Talk. My name is Serena, and joining us today is Fabio Turuzo, who will be presenting on the topic of securing microservices under 40 minutes with MicroProfile and Klikok. If you have any questions for Fabio as we move through today's presentation, feel free to ask them in the chat or use the Ask a Questions tab. Without any further delay, Fabio, over to you. Thank you, Serena. So, uh, before we begin, let me introduce myself. I'm Fabio Teresio. I work as Service Manager at uh, Payara Services Limited, which we are a company based in the UK, uh, part of the uh, all the processes of making Jakarta available to both customers and the community. And I've been doing several talks like this in online and on, in presence events uh, around the place. Uh, 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 last week, uh, at the release, I think, uh, I've been trying to uh, make more and more talks related to modern topics and, and things that people are interested in hearing about. So uh, before we start, let me just do some blood and self-promotion of Payara. We are a company that uh, we are trying to shape the future in the industry, specifically everything related to enterprise Java. We're strategic members of the Eclipse Foundation, and we rejoined the Eclipse Microprofile Working Group just recently. So the intention is that we as vendors of these technologies are also have the ability to, to steer some of the discussion and, and the features develop on behalf of our customers and our community users. And we are the main maintainers, our implementers of our platform enterprise, which is a solution, a commercial enterprise grade solution for uh, developing production Jakarta applications, uh, both on cloud and on premises. And our two main products at the moment are Payara Server Enterprise, which is a traditional application server runtime, like you would find in any other vendors, and Payara Micro Enterprise, which is uh, the optimized, uh, let's say, uh, simplified solution that you can use in order to run applications or more portable environments. So we also have our community offering, and the intention is that the community offering is built for the needs of development environments. It's focused on innovation. So everything that we uh, ship out as a feature will always come out in a community edition first, and then we'll ship it eventually to enterprise when it's fully stable and we have some good feedback from our community users. And the intention is that we want to uh, make sure that if you are, do not have a budget on your project or within your organization, you can get start the Empire as soon as you can because community is fully free and it's an open source product. So anything that we develop will be able or any user will be able to check on when it's uh, shipped out and they can even build the server by themselves or build the products if they need some specifics uh, uh, or have some specific constraints. So it's always important that they have that option. So let's get started. So the main topic of this talk is security. And security is hard, no matter the context. Doing security properly nowadays, it's always a challenge because there are many users who at night cannot sleep well whenever they consider all of the implications are actually protecting user information. That means user personal details, that means sensitive details that these users have access to, that means making sure that users in general follow good policies of password management, identity security, properly accessing secure environments in, the, in a controlled manner and following protocols. But the main challenges that most developers nowadays face are how to correctly, safely manage these identities. Are they storing a database? If they're storing a database, is that database secure? Is the database properly is structured in a way that any so only a specific people can access that. Is that database, actual, database on the data itself back up in the way that if in the event of a critical scenario, you can roll back to a previous version or anything like that. How to properly apply security patterns without reinventing the wheel? Because you see it nowadays, whenever you support software, most applications nowadays contain some piece of code that reinvents the create user account update user account, create password, update password type of code that you see in most applications. And that repetition and redundancy creates a lot of risks, which that is the intention of nowadays, it's trying to reduce the risks to the minimum. Uh, how to properly secure microservices without this minimal risk? Because when the traditional application is involved, 
then that is not a big issue. But when you are developing microservices, which structurally are multiple units, can even be hundreds of units separate to each other that require secure patterns, then really designing those secure patterns in a centralized manner is important. And finally, performance, because if you have security implemented in such a way that it's affecting the performance of environments that are highly available, then the users you will complain about it and say, hey, my the application is slow on the duress or on this specific times of the day I cannot access or why accessing my account is taking longer than five seconds, for example. So a solution nowadays that most companies are considering is an identity solution platform. And these identity solution platforms centralize the idea of, hey, you do not need to rethink all of these challenges. You don't need to re-implement everything. Just simply stick to a platform that is compatible with a standard, use it, and then you only concern yourself with making that access to that identity solution platform secure, making sure to follow good practices, and you will be okay most of the time. And these identity solution platforms, there are many flavors nowadays. I'm just listing this main four, which I have worked in various forms in the past. Out zero and Okta are third-party services, uh, cloud native services that anyone can access to and they have paid and three tiers that anyone can access to. And the intention is that uh, the data, the user information and identity data, it's stored by these third-party services. And there are, of course, arrangements to protect this data. But if you don't trust a third-party service and you want to store the data yourself and making sure that it's secure and it's not accessible by anyone else, you can also use an on-premises solutions like Foreshark or Keycloak, which is the main point of our talk today. And why Keycloak? Because uh, Keycloak is a good product that it's OpenID Connect compatible. OpenID Connect is the security standard or the de facto security standard of most cloud native applications and microservices nowadays. And the idea is that if you are interacting with an OpenID Connect compatible implementation of an identity platform and you don't like it, you can switch to another one and the changes to your applications should be minimal. Keycloak in particular has seamless single sign-on integration, so you can log in multiple times to an application without having to re-log in. Uh, open, it is a good solution for centralized user management. It has integration with multiple databases and allows you to create multiple realms. If in the case that you want to have multiple tenants or, or slices of universes of data for multiple users across an ecosystem of applications. It also has identity provider integration. It can also use federation to connect to Active Directory services or help that servers in order to separate the multiple data sources that may be connected to these applications. So not going to go in much detail about how OpenID Connect works, but the cru crux of the deal is that OpenID Connect establishes a centralized standard workflow that allows any users to request an authentication event in behalf of an application or when using an application and then obtain a token. And OpenID Connect is centralized around the idea of using an access token and an identity token. The access token will allow the user to validate themselves against the request of on a specific service or on a specific uh, service, uh, service endpoint in uh, multiple applications. And how it works is that that user navigates, then they are redirected to the OpenID Connect's login page or, or the OpenID, uh, OpenID Connect provider's login page. In this case, it would be Keycloak. Then that client will send a request, will authenticate the user and obtain the authorization, will give the user this identity token and the access token. The identity token is just the information of the user, their name, email, address, as it is configured. And the access token is just a centralized uh, JSON web token that will allow the user to execute calls and calls external services. So finally, you can use, uh, this is on a standard of OpenID Connect, you can use a specific user info endpoint that can allow the user to get more information about itself, permissions or specific roles or uh, data that that user may want to protect uh, on the identity platform. So 
the way to secure microservices is that so microservices usually rely on a stateless communication. So every time that you make a call to a service, that call is idempotent. That means that you give some data and expect something in return. And the idea is that this data would be uh, respective of the parameters that you have. So every request has to be authenticated separately. And for that reason, you have to validate how are you making sure that the user is uh, who they're saying they are and the identity, integrity, and confidentiality are preserved. So JSON Web Tokens is the good solution to consider. If there is an open idea standard that was uh, designed in order to actually make sure Open ID Connect is fully compatible across multiple tools and environments in the world in the ecosystem because again it is JSON and JSON is a digestible format that you can use in most tools. It relies on a set of standard claims and I will show you in a bit. Uh, these claims are just simply attributes on a JSON payload that will tell any technology that involves uh, themselves with the authentication process that this is what they expect. Uh, and again it is used for authentication and authorization strictly. That means that when you have a JSON with token the role of any server or service is to make sure that they can use that token to make sure, oh, is this user who they're claiming to be? Excellent. And in order to do this, tokens are signed using a cryptographic key that, and that, and that key can be used. And the token also have access or, and tells the servers, hey, I was signed with this key. Go on with the server that issued this token and verify that the token's integrity it has not been compromised. So as I mentioned, OpenID Connect is an interoperable uh, authentication protocol. It's ideal for REST services and JSON. It's built on top of OAuth 2. So uh, many of the technologies that Google designed for the uh, OAuth 2 authentications workflows were reused for OpenID Connect. And it is easy to use in message flows. That means when you have a lot of information exchanging from one server to the other. So finally, the last component of all of the stack that we are mentioning it's a place micro profile and this is a jakarta aligned technology that was originally designed for developing microservices quickly in the jakarta ecosystem because jakarta at the moment uh at, or well in the past when it was been transitioning as a uh, fully open source technology it did not have the velocity for designing apis for most modern environments and specifically an api for interacting with JSON web tokens and open ID connect environments. So this was designed as a separate uh, set of technologies that now they are being integrated and being aligned with Jakarta IE. In the future, we don't know exactly if these APIs will remain in micro profile, if they will be uh, still be Jakarta IE aligned. But for the moment, if any Jakarta IE runtime that you are aware of and you're using, probably it also has my in, in, or it has compatible micro profile uh facilities so in the case of payara which is the technology that we use all of our products are both jakarta and micro profile compatible so any api is available and the specification of micro profile that we're interested in is micro profile json with tokens or json with token propagation and at the moment the api that we uh, have implemented it's uh, or payara has implemented is 2.0 which allows role pass role based access control to services. The only thing that you have to do on a service is telling these specific roles defined in my identity platform can call these services. If a user that tries to call the service doesn't have that role, then identity or uh, sorry, that operation is denied. And in the terms of any specific uh, REST endpoint validation, most users will expect to get an HTTP 403 error status code, meaning forbidden. You are not allowed to make uh, a call to this operation. And JSON when tokens allow the services to introspect the identity of a caller. That means, okay, I have this token and I see this is the user that is making this call, but I don't need to validate. I just simply delegate the identity validation. To whom? To well, the identity validation is delegated to the runtime. The application doesn't have to worry about that. It's just simply say, okay, I received this token this token was issued by this specific server. The server can tell me if that uh, token is valid and the identity of the user who requested that token is valid as well. And this flexible claim validation can be extended if in the case that you have complex needs. So uh, 
in order to showcase all of this, because again, uh, I'm going to talk about all this, but it's good to see it live. I have prepared this demo on GitHub. It is on my personal uh, profile, microservices key clock demo. It is fully functional and yeah, anyone can download it and they can use it uh, in order to understand a bit better about the technologies I'm going to be showcasing. So before I dive into the demo, allow me to just give a brief overview of what it is. This is a three application component um, let's say a multi-profile project on Maven. It contains two microservices application for a conference event management website, which is uh, kind of what I, what I like to do on my demos is just to use that uh, as a way of showcasing, hey, what about a user that wants to uh, create sessions or register speakers to a talk? Well, they can use this. So the two microservices applications are one speaker application that allows you to manage the speakers that will talk in an event and a session microservice that will allow to manage the session talks held at the event. And there is a final application, a single page application uh, designed using Angular, which uses these microservices and it will interact with key clothes separately in order to obtain the tokens and integrate itself with it. So the Applications uh, in questions will interact with these roles. And I'm making this distinction here that there are groups and roles. And the way that most uh, identity platform solutions nowadays are designed is that users have roles assigned to them. The roles are permissions or uh, functionalities that these users have access to in the universe of the applications configured on the identity platform. And in order to simplify that, because again, we don't want to assign multiple roles to users, and then when those users change, then okay, how do how do we change permissions in an organic way? So most identity platforms, in this case Keycloak, support groups which are just groups of roles. And the way you can map directly a user with a group and the group with the roles that that user will be assigned to. So in this case, the admin group will have access to all of these roles. They will be able to create new session talks, view all session talks, delete session talks, etc. The speaker group will have access to these roles. And you can see in parentheses that the speaker, the, the actual role name, which I will showcase in Keycloak is designed like this. Uh, the speakers can view register sessions, can view all of their fellow speakers, and can register themselves as speakers. Why they would do that? Well, I designed this application to showcase it in a kind of, <laughs> let's say, uh, in intuitive manner, but to showcase how can it be done. And finally, attendees. The attendees are the ones that go and attend the session so they can see the speakers that have registered. They, hands, they can see the session talks and they can request or they can attend a session if they're interested. So they require this, this permission. So let's go then to the demo. And as I showing, the demo has three components, but also you will see that there is a key cloak data folder in here that contains a JSON payload. And this is the realm data for my key cloak uh, instance, which I am going to be provisioning a bit. All of these are defined data that you can export on a key cloak file. Uh, this is a proprietary format based on JSON that you can use to feed any new realm. Again, this is only intended to be done as a development tool, I, technically, because Keycloak is connected to multiple databases, the way to explore and manipulate data should be on the database itself rather than exporting it to a file. But for simplicity and for demo, I'm not doing it like this. So let me show you. To run Keycloak, I have prepared this. Um, let me show you Docker configuration which uh, simply uses the official key clock image. We are, I'm using the latest version. I am starting a development server using the import realm command that will import the key clock file that I showed you recently. And finally, I am configuring the default realm with these uh, credentials, uh, the admin user with an admin password. Again, this is development. So the intention is just to make sure that I can start quickly a key clock server. Allow me to give you here so. Uh, this should be running quickly, but in the meantime, the other three components, the conference applications in here, as I mentioned, this is an Angular application that is configured uh, in order to interact with the services. Why I strictly use Angular? Because of preference, but this is just a way to showcase 
how uh, you can do any web application. Uh, either you can use uh, Jakarta components like JSF or MVC or any other technologies or web frameworks that you are familiar with. Or if you are not familiar with, you can use even other technologies like Node.js and JavaScript. And the services that are coded in uh, standard Jakarta frameworks, in this case, compatible with Payara, should be good. Okay, so Keyclock is ready to run. Let me show you then how do we access it. So let's access the admin interface at port 808080, which is the map at port on my co-host. You can see uh, Keyclock is loading. Let's connect with admin admin. And in here, you will see that there is a conference realm. Keycloak manages realms, which in this case are universes of data. You can have complete separate universes for multiple applications or for a strictly one application if you want to go that route. And in this case, the conference realm has a client configure. Clients are the applications that will connect, in this case, uh, to the universes of user data in order to request tokens and interact with them. So these are default applications or default clients that Keycloak provides. The only one that we're interested in is this conference web, which is the uh, dashboard of the web application that I'm going to go in a bit. Some important settings that any user needs to consider are the redirect URIs and the logout URIs. These are URIs that will be used by Keycloak to redirect the user once the authentication goes successfully. So the application will direct the user to the Keycloak UI. Uh, that means they will have to log in. That, that will give the application that requested the login or the authentication process a code. That code will be used to revalidate the application against Keycloak or, or the identity platform. That is a standard open ID authentication flow. And then the user will get redirected back to the application. And this redirection has to be validated, which is important that every client definition has a valid redirect query. And in the case of a logout, it's the same. When you log out, then the user is telling Keycloak these tokens that the user has requested are no longer valid. They are finishing the session. Please uh, complete the session on the identity provider and log out the user on the uh, original application. So you have to also define client scopes. And this is important because the client scopes, it's how a user is being given data to work with when requesting an authentication token. Most of these uh, scopes are defined by default. On Keycloak, the only one that we're interested in is this one, the MicroProfile JWT. Because this MicroProfile JWT scope will add automatically add two, and we can see this uh, here in client scopes, this will add two additional claims in here. One claim called the UPN or use prefer name, which is this is defined as a standard claim by MicroProfile, JWT, and is required. And the other is the groups. And unfortunately, this is, let's say, um, a, a bit of a confusing misnomer because groups in the sense of MicroProfile are also not the name for roles. So if I go to this client scope, you can see that Technically, what it's doing is just simply re renaming or, or, or sorry, uh, yes, it's adding these standard groups for uh, the talking claim name groups, and this is just simply remapping the roles. And it's been added to the access token, and it's been added to the ID token as well. I could just simply configure this not to be added to the ID token, but that's pretty much OK. So going back to the client definition, that's the only thing that I have to do. I have to configure my redirect URIs. I have to add the micro profile, sorry, micro profile JWT as a default client scope. And that's it. How do we manage our users? So you will see that in the Keycloak admin, there are a series of already created users. These are just as users I have created. Uh, all Michael Alpha, Carol Beta, and Oscar Gamma. Michael is an admin, Carol is a speaker, and Oscar is an attendee. So, the way that is defined is that the realm rooms that I mentioned are already configured. And here you can see add spe as X speakers, can add speakers, can create sessions, and the groups are already defined and they are remapping these roles. So the admin role will contain, sorry, the admin group will contain a mapping to all of these roles. The attendee will contain just to these three roles, the speaker to these four roles as well. And every user is configured 
with a specific group. So that's the way that it's designed. So the group membership is how Keycloak defines it, and that's how you uh, assign this to the user. So back to the application. Let's run this. So let's run our services. So, whoops, oh, I restart the key clip. Okay. So let's run session service. Let's run speaker service. And let's run our Angular server as well. And while these are starting, let me to show you the configuration. So the microservices are Jakarta and MicroProfile compatible applications. You can see on the Maven files that they are just simply uh, microprofile compatible uh, dependencies and the Jakarta platform dependencies as well. And I am using the Fire Micro Maven plugin to automatically start this from the command line or from the Maven uh, configuration. And in this particular case, and let me see this, the session service, it's defining the standard microprofile configuration keys. In this case, it's, this is a standard property called mp.jwt.verify.publickey.location. And this needs to point out to a standard URI that will be provided by Keycloak. In this case, it's the URL of the Keycloak server uh, slash realms slash the realm name slash protocol slash open ID connects slash certs. And I also have to define another standard property called the issuer, which is what is the server that generated the token? Because again, the token has to be validated against a public key. That public key can be located anywhere, can be a file on the application, or can be exposed publicly, because again, it's a publicly by the server. But I also have to go and verify which server generated this token. So in this case, the server itself is just the URL of the server which is, and the realm name. So in this case, it would be uh, localhost, 8080, realms, conference. That's it. That's the only thing that I need to configure on my application for it to verify the JSON web tokens. How I define that is that this application will contain uh, a Jakarta REST services definition. And this contains an application scope, application path class. And you can see that it's annotated with login config. This is an, an annotation from MicroProfile. These are tokens that simply tells that this application will be using MicroProfile JWT. And I'm declaring roles, but in this case, it will be groups, admin, attendee, speaker. But if I go to the specific endpoints, in this case, these are Jakarta REST endpoints, you can see that uh, the session resource contains an endpoint to create sessions, and it will receive a session object, and it will internally use Jakarta JSON binding in order to convert the JSON payload to a Java object. Uh, and this method is only allowed to users who have the can create sessions roles. The same with the uh, get all method will get me all of the sessions. This, since it's, this doesn't have a roles allowed annotation, it will use the one defined on the class, which in this case is can see sessions. And the same for the other methods. There's an interesting thing that you can do and allow me to show you the speaker service as well, because this one is a bit more involved. In here, you can see that, oh, sorry, here on the speaker resource, you can see that I can also inject data that comes from the token claims. And it can use this claim annotation, this belongs to MicroProfile API, to inject X specific claims of the authenticated user. Of course, it can only be accessed when you are secure or that you're making an authenticated and validated call. Uh, using an access token. And in this case, I can use these current groups, which will get me the list of all of the groups that the user that is currently authenticated belongs to. Uh, well, again, as I mentioned, MicroProfile, JWT, uh, equates groups to roles. So in this sense, this is just another, uh, um, uh, no, an equivalent for all the list of roles mapped to that particular user. And you can see that I'm using here on the add speaker method. And I ask if the actual user authenticated belongs to the speaker role, then I will set the identity of that user to the user name that I can extract from the security context. This is our Jakarta standard API that allows me to get the current user principal, as in the, the principal of the authentication 
that was successfully done and obtain its name, which is a username. And again, I am just simply doing this as a way to validate that I can interact with the data in particular. How I'm defining the speaker service, it's similarly, as you can see here, it's configured using the micro, uh, via a micro Maven plugin. But in this case, I'm using properties on command line options. I, the properties are defined on a standard file called micro profile configuration properties, which has the public key location and the user. This is another way to do so micro profile. It uses a standard API called micro profile configuration, which allows you to use configuration variables from either environment variables, system properties, and a standard file like this, or command line options as I showed you before. So uh, with the services run, how is the Angular application actually interacting with all of this? And I will not go into much detail because again, if the Angular is, uh, let's say a bit, a bit convoluted, but the only thing that I'm doing, it's configuring my application with this key cloud configuration. It will just simply tell the application, hey, your client, remember the client that we created on Keycloak, it's called Conference Web, belongs to the conference realm, and it's located in this URL. And the way that this Keycloak configuration is fed into the application is by using the, uh, in this case, I'm using a standard Angular module called Keycloak Angular. And this uses the Keycloak JavaScript APIs. These are standard and provided by a JavaScript adapter from the Keycloak libraries. And the way that I'm doing this is I'm just simply creating a provider for all of the Angular configuration in here that will automatically do the login, or in this case, well, the login is not automatic, it has to be triggered. So this is done on this component. Give me a second. Well, just simply doing this authorization service dot login and giving an options. I'm giving this the option to always prompt the login, not to assume that the user is remember to always re-login the user if, even if they have been logging previously. And this is done as a way to just simply showcase that. And the authorization service automatically will allow any REST endpoint or HTTP call done on the application's behalf to automatically inject the uh, out uh, the authorization token. In this case, it's uh, it needs to go in the header of the application. So for example, in here, I have a component that does the calls to the service URL to uh, load the sessions and create the sessions. Let me see you here, yeah, create the session. This will call this a specific URL and we'll fed all of this data. And as you can see in here, I'm not injecting any token because this is done automatically by the Keycloak library. So the way to showcase this is that we go to the applications UI. So you can see, okay, we have started. Let's log in. Now you can see that I have been redirected to Keycloak on local security like realms conference protocol open ID connect on the out endpoint. And the one that is being requested is for the conference web client, redirect URI on behalf of this application. So let's log in as one of the users, for example, let's log in as the speaker. So they have the same username as a password. Let's sign in. You can see there I have been signing in as this user. Let's go to the sessions. I can see some session data in here. So since she uh, and this particular uh, user, Carol Beta, is a speaker, they should be able to register themselves as a speaker. So Let's try to do that. So let's do this on behalf of sample organization. The only thing that I need is just to save and you can see that they, they are registered on the speaker. So if I go to the console, uh, sorry, to network, let's reload this and see for example, oh, but you haven't accepted or you haven't accepted yourself as a speaker. Let's see if you can accept yourself. No, you're not authorized to accept your speaker. And you can see here that on the uh, HTTP endpoint, you are getting a 403 forbidden because yes, this was not an authorized call. And again, because this user is not authorized to do that specific operation. Who can do that? Oh, well, the admin can. So let's log out. Let's log in as the admin. So in that case, we'll be user alpha. Let's go to the speaker session, uh, sorry, the speakers view and see, can we accept this speaker? Let's load here so that we can quickly see this. 
And yes, that user can execute this operation. You can see that it was accepted. So in this post operation, yes, 202 accepted, no issues in there. What is the token? Are you going to ask? Well, the token, as I mentioned, is automatically fed. It's here on the authorization header as a better token. And you can see this information in here. Let's see if I can copy and paste it. And in here, you can automatically decode these tokens. Uh, let's see if I can do this. Ah, well, it's, I can do it well because information is not, uh, well, I can copy that well. But there's a way to see tokens. If you want to see the token as generated by Keycloak, you can just simply go to the client in here. OK, I have to re-log in. So let me log in as the admin user for the realm. Go to conference web. Let's go then to client scopes. And in here, you can see an evaluate tab. And in evaluate tab, you can generate ID and access tokens for a sample user based on the profiles on a specific, sort of based on a specific scope. This scope is a standard uh, Open ID Connect feature where you can specify this token will contain certain parts of the user's identity based on their request. And the default scope parameter added is open ID. This is by default as defined on the specification. So let's grab this user Malfa. Let's generate the access token. And uh, observe, oh, I have to here. There we go. Generate access tokens. And you can see here that my access token it's uh, generated. It contains these standard claims, the expiration, which is a time span when this token expires, when it was generated, the JTE, which is an ID requested by MicroProfile, the use issuer, which is the server that generated the token, the type of the token, which is a better token, the application that is being secure. Uh, and then there are other additional data added by uh, key clock, in this case, the subject, which is the ID or internal ID of the user, the session state, allow origins, how to access the realm, how to access the resources, and then the UPN and the groups claims, which are a standard of microprofile. The UPN is the username, in this case, or the user preferred name, and the groups, which are exactly the same as the roles. They have to be added. I mean, it's a bit repetitive and redundant, but this is as required. So this way you can see that we have done integration with the application. And in no way I am storing this information or any data on my application. All of that is managed by Keycloak. The service, the only thing that it's doing is just making sure that it can talk to Keycloak and can validate the tokens. But my services do not contain any data of users. They are storing data, as you can see here. My services are using JP, uh, JPA or Jakarta Persistence to automatically store user information on a database. And the services will use an embedded database because they are for development purposes. But I'm not storing user information. I'm not storing credentials. I'm not storing passwords, no roles, not who has access to nothing. No, the only thing that I'm telling my application is who has access to the services from now uh, and a, an outsider's perspective. And the identity platform is responsible for being the glue to everything. So going back then to the presentation, in summary, as I mentioned, Keycloak will allow you to delegate user management and authentication. And you just don't have to worry about coding yourself logic to how to create the user, how to validate the user, how to generate the password of a user. No, all of that will be managed by the identity platform. Simplify the authentication workflow because my applications, the only, have, the only thing that they have to do is to know where the identity platform is, and then the APIs will handle everything. Remove security challenges from microservices. My microservices don't have to worry about the identity management. The only thing that they have to worry about is to validate the tokens, making sure that the roles are being correctly coded uh, as to allow access to these operations and centralize the user management, maintenance, and security. So when you are running Keycloak for a universe of, let's say, hundreds of applications, instead of having to allow every application to recode and manage the users, you can just simply centralize into one or multiple Keycloak realms, and then you have to worry just about maintaining those realms. A microprofile JWT will allow you to plug in an existing, okay, make a mistake here. It should be Keycloak, not Okta. Okta is as I mentioned, I have multiple variants of these talks. And yes, uh, we'll 
plugin and existing key cloud realms via configuration properties. No worry about token validation algorithms because that is done by the runtime itself. You don't have as a developer to validate the tokens yourselves and focus on setting role constraints to existing services. So yeah, that's that's it. Pretty much done on the 40 minutes. <laughs> so uh, there are, are there any questions? That's amazing. Thank you so much, uh, Fabio, for this great presentation and, and demonstration here. Um, but uh, Edward Prieto has a question. He says, hi, everyone. Sorry if I missed something, but this token has any expiration. Should I set that up? Yes, tokens are defined by the specification to be expired, I think, by default in 15 seconds. How OpenID Connect works is that when the access token expires, the identity platform has to provide something called a refresh token. And the refresh token is a way for the client that generated or requested that original token to just simply get a new one without re-authenticating the user. All of this is done internally by the API. You don't have to worry about anything. You can modify the expiration of a token uh, you can see here on the RAM settings on key clock that I have configured this to be, oh, I, I extended them, 15 minutes. To prevent, <laughs> again, it, it is negligible, but but it should be it should be longer. Access tokens must expire. And I think that it is recommended to be shorter than the NSSA uh, idle tower, which is 30 minutes. Access tokens shouldn't be long-lived. The refresh token, on the other hand, it is long-lived. And you can see here uh, that you can even configure the revocation for refresh tokens. And you can do this on any identity platform, not just Keycloak, uh, Okta, Alt0, Forshrock, allow you to decide, oh, I don't want this user to log in anymore. You can just simply revoke access to the refresh token automatically to the access token and that user shouldn't access it. Okay, great. Um, so there doesn't seem to be any other questions in the ask a questions and or on the chat. So again, thank you for that excellent presentation today. And uh, we're also looking to book some more Jakarta Tech Talks throughout 2023. So if you are interested in presenting, feel free um, to fill out the form that I just uh, popped into the chat. And finally, if you also have any feedback on the Tech Talk program, we would love to hear from you. So just click on the green button uh, that will pop up once we end uh, this webinar. Webinar. So thank you again, Fabio, and thanks everyone for attending. I hope you have thank a wonderful you. rest of your day or evening. Thank you, everyone. Take yep. care. Have a good day, everyone. You too. Bye. Bye.